Lord, I come before your throne. to you all on this uh, uh, Palm Sunday service. Uh, of course, we remember, don't we, Jesus riding into Jerusalem in triumph, the crowd shouting Hosanna, only for a few days later, Jesus to be re rejected by sinful men and led out to die the cruelest of deaths on a cross. Why? So that you and I, the guilty ones, might go free, be set free from sin, so let's pray shall we father help us to come before you today and worship you as our righteous glorious king and savior amen well a little later in our service today we're going to be looking at that account from john's gospel of jesus being uh, coming into jerusalem as king so that's for later but to begin our service with today i couldn't think of a better hymn to start with Ride on, ride on in majesty. Ride on in majesty and hark all the tribes, Hosanna cry. O Saviour meek, pursue your road with palms and scattered garments stowed. Let's sing this very traditional, well-known hymn together, shall we? <laughs>
it's lovely to start a service with a traditional hymn, isn't it? But let's pray before we sing our next hymn this morning. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you today that you knew when you rode in triumph into Jerusalem that you were riding to the cross. Thank you, Lord, that you were prepared to do that for each one of us today because of your great love for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, we need to worship the Lord in our hearts, don't we? That's why we meet together. That's why we come to together in fellowship. And our next hymn is, I will worship with all of my heart. I will praise you with all my strength. Let's sing this hymn together today, shall we? I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone are long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. When we go into that book of Revelation at the end of our Bibles, that great uh, word that came to John the Apostle on the island of Patmos, this is what we read in Revelation 7 verses 9 through to 10. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice salvation 
belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Well, of course, our God is King of Kings and he's Lord of Lords, isn't he? And we're going to sing again now, King of Kings, Majesty, God of Heaven, living in me, gentle Saviour, closest friend, strong Deliverer, beginning and end. Let's sing these lovely words together today, shall we? Your Majesty, I can but bow, I lay my all before you now. In royal robes I don't deserve, I live to serve your Majesty. Well, let's come now, shall we, to our prayers and let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we read the Gospel accounts of your triumphal entry into Jerusalem, we read how the crowd strewed palm branches and garments in your path, echoing the events of Solomon riding into Jerusalem to be proclaimed king. Lord, many who processed with you that day would later turn against you, shouting, Crucify! But Lord, we're reminded by the Apostle Paul that on that glorious day when you return in glory, that every knee will bow before you, even those who would deny you today or reject you, all will have to proclaim you king forever because your reign is eternal. Amen. Well, I came across an, a, a Puritan prayer of confession uh, just recently in my, writing, in my readings and I've abridged it, obviously, for, because of the language so different from the 16th century to today. And we read this. Let's pray. Loving Father, we praise you continually that you give us permission to approach your throne of grace, to spread our wants and our desires before you. But Father, we know we're not worthy of your blessings and your mercies, for we are far gone from original righteousness 
Our depraved nature reveals itself in disobedience and rebellion. Our early days discovered in us discontent, pride, envy, rage. Father, please forgive us all our past sins and remember them no more. And help us by your Spirit to live for you forevermore. Amen. And Father, as we enter Holy Week, Help us with thankful hearts to reflect over the next few days on your journey to the cross, to the events of the upper room and the Last Supper, the humility you showed in washing the feet of your disciples, the institution of the act of remembrance that you command us to do until you come again in glory, your betrayal by Jesus Iscariot, your prayers for us as believers recorded in John's Gospel. The agony of praying before the Father that his will be done and not yours, Lord Jesus. The denial of a friend. Your arrest and interrogation by Annas and Caiaphas. Being handed over to the Romans, to Pilate, to the brutality of the Roman soldiers and their mockery of you before leading you out to be crucified as a common criminal. Lord, as we reflect on these things, let us remember that all these were done for us, that we, before you, the guilty ones, might be set free from sin, and know peace in our hearts with you, Lord Jesus. Thank you today, Father. Amen. And Father, we pray for our Maundy Thursday service later this week and for the hour at the cross service on Good Friday. And we pray that you will go before both Peter and myself as we prepared both these services. And Lord, although we can't meet in person at either service, we pray that we can come together through the medium of either the internet or in written form. Lord, we thank you that we can enjoy worshipping together in your glorious name. Amen. And Father, with thankful hearts, we look forward to our Easter Sunday service and we want to praise and thank you that we will once again meet back in the church. We pray, Lord, that you will go before us as we meet and help us to continue to observe all the advice given to protect each one of us from the coronavirus. Lord, we would pray for our friends at All Saints and at URC as they each meet to worship and praise you, our living Saviour and Lord. Amen. And finally this morning, Father, we want to pray that you'll bring comfort and healing to all who are suffering in body, soul and mind today. Strengthen those who are in hospital at this time, Lord. Strengthen them by your Spirit's power that they may receive a real sense and feeling in their hearts of being healed by you. Lord, we pray in the great name of Jesus that you will hear our prayers today. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to come to uh, God's Word now, so please turn to John's Gospel, John chapter 12, please, if you would. And we're going to be looking specifically today at verses 12 through to 19. But before that, let's pray, shall we? Let's offer this time before the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Father, help us as we look at these verses today to hear again the account of you riding into Jerusalem as king. Help us to see that you are both our king and our saviour. And we ask this, Lord, that you'll help us today in your loving name. Amen. Amen. Well, I wonder, how in control do you feel uh, that you are of the events in your life today? Let me read that again because I made a bit of a hash of it. How in control do you feel you are today of the events in your life? Well, as many of you know, earlier in January, although Ali and I had taken every precaution we could to sticking to the guidance about washing our hands, wearing face masks, not meeting with others, yet we both became really unwell 
with COVID-19 and we went for our tests and of course those tests proved positive and for the next fortnight or so we were in isolation feeling absolutely lousy. You know we thought like I'm sure millions of others have thought that if we did the right thing we could remain in control and not contract COVID-19. Well, I won't ruffle my hair up and put on a silly voice, but at the risk of sounding like the PM, we must, of course, continue to stick to the guidance we've been given by the government and the scientists. And if we haven't had the vaccine yet, then I pray it won't be long before it reaches you. Because we know that doing these things will minimise the risk of contracting the virus. Well, of course, it raises a question, doesn't it? Who then is in control? Who's in control of things? My point is this. You know, there's many people today, and I guess we got sucked into it a little bit ourselves. They think and behave as if they're the absolute masters of their destiny. They imagine they have complete control of everything themselves. After all, that's, that's the sort of spin that the world puts on us today, doesn't it? But if you go back into the events recorded in both the Apostle John and the Synoptic Gospel writers' accounts of Jesus' life and his ministry, especially the last week of Jesus' earthly life, you know, the Pharisees, Pilate, the Roman soldiers, and no doubt many who were shouting crucify. They, well, they all thought, didn't they, that they were in control. In truth, none of them had any control over the events surrounding Jesus' passion. And I believe we see that very clearly in what's headed in our Bibles, in John's Gospel, John 12, the triumphal entry, or if it's some versions, Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. Both those headings are true, of course. So just to begin, we'd look with me at John chapter 12 and verses 12 to 13. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Well, today, we often see planned demonstrations, don't we? You know, where people want to put their point of view over. We saw it this recently at Clapham Common, and some of those events, of course, were regretful. And, you know, when people want to get their point of view over, or they want to make a point, let's put it that way, they'll organise a demonstration. Most of the time, has has to be said, they're very peaceful affairs. But of course, if we go abroad, we go to places like Hong Kong and now Myanmar, where you get a dictatorial government who doesn't believe in democracy, then they, of course, tend to stamp down on any form of demonstration against their rule and their authority. Well, I don't want to politicise this, but Jesus made a demonstration publicly of who he is, who he was. And you know, if we go back to John 11, we see that Jesus has raised his friend Lazarus to life. And even though Lazarus has been dead for four days, and of course the news of a miracle soon got back to the Pharisees. And after calling a meeting of the Sanhedrin, and out of fear of losing religious control and the fear of the Romans possibly taking away the temple and the nation, what we read in chapter 11 verse 53 is this. From that day on, this is the Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of all the Sanhedrin, they plotted to take Jesus' life. But we come back to the thought that we've been has been running through this morning. Who's in control? As we know, whilst there's still restrictions in place, vast crowds of people attending events is something that's uh, 
be widely observed. We know that there's a few people that are not doing that, unless of course you're uh, living in India and you've gone to a test match or you're a Glasgow Rangers fan. We know in the main people are abiding by the, the rules. But now, now was the time for Jesus to make a public demonstration and a public declaration of just who he is. And what we read here in verse 5 is that, uh, sorry, is that uh, five days before Passover, having heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, a great crowd came out to meet him. Many, no doubt, having heard that he'd raised Lazarus from the dead. Well, just go back if you can to those events. Just try and picture the scene if you can. And look back at what John tells us in verse 9. He says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. Well, you know, someone being raised from the dead, even by today's medical advancements, is pretty miraculous, isn't it? But if you go back to then... It certainly wasn't something that was commonplace, was it? So we can imagine how this miracle must have got people chatting, talking. Wow, did you see that? Have you heard this? You can imagine, can't you? And no doubt many who were on their way up to Jerusalem were possibly from Galilee. They may have seen some of the other miracles that Jesus had performed. They probably heard him teach. They'd seen how different he was to their religious leaders. And we know from what John says in John 6, the account of where Jesus fed 5,000. After that, a great miracle, and, uh, you know, a lot of the people said this, surely this is the prophet. Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And Jesus knew because he knows all our hearts, doesn't he? He knew that they intended then did the crowd to force him and make him king but as jesus often says in the scriptures in the early part of the scriptures his time hadn't yet come but now it has so what they didn't of course realize people back then and many people today don't realize is that we don't make jesus king you and i don't make him king he is king. He is the undisputed king. In fact, he's the only true and rightful king. And as such, well, our very lives should worship and honour him. That's what we should be doing, isn't it? So just coming back to that scene for a minute, Jesus has left Bethany. He's being followed by the crowd who come to see Lazarus. And as he makes his way down through the Mount of Olives, there's a vast crowd coming up the other way. And of course, they meet and they all start to praise the Lord. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. You know, we shouldn't have regrets, and I know that. But you know, a, a sadness for me as pastor is that whilst we're extremely blessed with a wonderful tots group and very godly leaders, we don't have an active group of youngsters in our church and I, I find that very sad. So I never really feel that we're a complete family. Why do I say that? Because you see such festivals as this, Palm Sunday, they're a great opportunity for kids to act out gospel accounts like this. Events that you know jolly well they're going to remember for the rest of their lives probably. So it says here, verse 13, Hosanna. That's what the crowd shouted. If you've uh, got a Bible that has footnotes in it, you'll see that Hosanna was a Hebrew expression meaning save. And, you know, this expression, this goes right back to Psalm 118. And it's a psalm that was traditionally sung at Passover. And it went... Hosanna, blessed is he who is coming in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Blessed is it is the King that is coming, the kingdom of our father David. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. That's the sort of thing they would have sung. 
But, you know, we can only imagine, can't we, what the Pharisees must have been thinking when they saw such a large, large crowd processing with Jesus and proclaiming him king. You see, where the Pharisees thought that they were in control and that they could perhaps do away with Jesus quietly, probably before Passover, and they could enjoy the festival, it must have dawned on them that control was beginning to slip out of their hands. And you see, not only did Jesus have full control of the events of his entry into Jerusalem, what else is there? Well, it's backed up, isn't it, in the scriptures. It was foretold in the Hebrew scriptures. Just look with me at verses 14 through to 16. We read here, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples didn't understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realise that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. So here's this demonstration by Jesus where he's revealing that he's a king, but he's also here revealing the true nature of his kingship. Well, as we know, there's been two of the younger royals have been in the news recently. Why? Well, because they wanted to take back control, didn't they? They were a little bit adamant that they weren't going to fulfill some of the royal duties. Well, I'm not going to comment on that. But if you went back to 1953, the Queen may not have wanted to turn up to Westminster Abbey in what a lot of people say is the most uncomfortable coronation coach that has ever been, this gold coach that was used. But of course it wasn't a matter of choice for her to decide, was it? Others were in control. But what we know from all four gospel writers is that Jesus was in full control of what he rode into Jerusalem on. Verse 14, a young donkey. The synoptic gospels, of course, give us a much uh, greater insight and a fuller account of the events of that Palm Sunday. Jesus telling the disciples to go and, and find these two uh, a donkey and a colt and bring them back. But what all four gospel writers do record is the words of Zechariah, Zechariah 9 verse 9, because this prophecy takes us right back into the history of God's people to a prophetic word that was given to this man Zechariah who was a priest who was actually born in exile in Babylon. So that's how far it went back to around the 6th century BC. But it was a prophecy that went even further back. And it was a prophecy that God had given his people during their wilderness wanderings. A prophecy that would only reach its fulfilment with the return of the Davidic king to Zion. When through Jesus, God would, uh, God would finally deal with sin and disobedience in his people through the shedding of blood. Verse 9, Zechariah tells us this king would ride into Jerusalem lowly, riding on a donkey. And that was an act that I'm sure wasn't lost on many of the Jews of that day, because it actually went back to yet another event. I mentioned it in our opening prayers. Go back to 1 Kings 1. King David, now a very elderly man, barely alive, soon to go to glory. But before he died, one of his sons, a man called Adonijah, decided to set himself up as David's successor. He was going to proclaim himself as king. In fact, he did proclaim himself as king. And he brought some of the army on board with him. He brought some of the priests on board with him. But he wasn't the rightful king because sometime before, David had made a promise to Bathsheba that their son Solomon would reign 
after David. And if you go to 1 Kings, this is what we read. David says this. He says, take your Lord's servants with you and have Solomon, my son, mount my own mule and take him down to Gihon. There have Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel. Blow the trumpet and shout, long live King Solomon. Then you're to go up with him and he is to come and sit on my throne and reign in my place. I, David, have appointed him king. Well, without going off at too much of a tangent, because I, I kind of sense when I was preparing this, there's probably another sermon here. One Kings makes clear that this chap Adonijah wasn't the true successor to King David. And as such, he had absolutely no claim, no right to David's throne. Well, you know, as God's people, you and I, we should have only one king. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he should be the one who's ruling in our lives, ruling over us, ruling in us. And any other who may claim the throne in our lives is a usurper. One king's tells us that this chap Adonijah ended up being put to death. And as brutal as that might seem, you know, if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, then we're to get rid of all those who would seek to have the authority of a king in our lives. Whatever that might be, whoever they may be. Well, of course, it wasn't until Jesus was glorified that the apostles, uh, the disciples rather, fully understand verse 16 that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him so again in the events of Jesus coming into Jerusalem as king we see him making a public demonstration before all the people including the Pharisees of who he is something of course he hadn't done publicly before and how all that happened that day was a fulfillment of the scriptures revealing that Jesus is the true Davidic king the Messiah but of course at that time Israel as we know was under Roman occupation and although Jesus by riding into Jerusalem on a donkey he symbolized he was coming as a king coming in peace to bring us peace with God that of course wasn't what many in the crowds wanted this king to be. Look with me at verses 17 to 19 because what it does it begs the question what sort of Messiah do we want ourselves? Verses 17 to 19. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people because they heard that he had performed the sign went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. We well, can just imagine, can't we, that something like an event like Lazarus being raised from the dead, it wasn't something that you could keep hidden, could you? The fact that he was up and about, he was walking around, he was having meals and he was well, was proof that Jesus had raised him from the dead. And it's very much a pivotal moment, isn't it, in the scriptures. And it's an event that drew many more people to come and follow Jesus. Which, of course, made him even more unpopular with the Pharisees. Because, as I said before, he threatened their rule. He's threatening their authority. And as more and more and more people believed in him, then the Pharisees saw this in a political sense. They saw he was a threat to their masters, the Romans. Would they react? Would they come and take away the temple? Would they come and take away the nation? These guys were living in fear. But you know, it's often the case in the scriptures, isn't it, that God speaks through the most unlikely of people. If you go back to, to chapter 11, Caiaphas was high priest at the time. And he made this prophetic statement. He said this to the Sanhedrin. He said, you know, you don't realise that it's better for you that one man die for the people 
than the whole nation perish. It's better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. Well, as Caiaphas, he was God's high priest. And what he said is clearly a word from God. It's a prophecy, isn't it? It's a prophecy that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. But not only for them, but for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. But in Caiaphas's mind, putting Jesus to death, of course, was a political move. It was a way of removing the threat that they thought Jesus posed from the Romans. If people continued to go on over to him, if he continued to be as popular as he was at this particular time. Whereas God's plan was that he should indeed die for the nation. And in doing so, Jesus' death would take away all the trouble that sin causes for those who believe in him so that they would not perish, but as John 3 reminds us, have eternal life. You know, what becomes clear from this passage of Scripture is that if we go forward to when Jesus was brought before Pilate, many in the crowd shouting crucify were probably among those who processed with him into Jerusalem, proclaiming him king, waving palm branches, shouting Hosanna, but clearly, both they and, of course, the religious leaders, they failed to understand the signs, much as they'd done right the way through Jesus' earthly ministry. But seeing Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and not a war horse was a clear sign that he'd come to bring peace, not to make war with the Romans, but as the scriptures testify, to bring us peace with God and with one another. How? Through his blood shed for us on the cross. But, just like many people today, what the people wanted then was the sort of king who was prepared to do their bidding. You know, someone who they could bring out like a genie who would perform a miracle, in that case, getting rid of the Romans, and getting rid of all of their enemies. Then, of course, there were the Pharisees who plotted to do away with Jesus because they didn't want someone to threaten the status quo, threaten the temple, threaten the nation, threaten their authority. Well, when we look at those two groups, they're both evident in the world today, aren't they? There's those who only want the sort of Jesus who will do their bidding. They don't want someone in control of their lives. They don't want somebody to rule over them. They want to be in control. They want to bring Jesus out to do their bidding when they want. And then there's those who want nothing to do with him because they know he threatens the status quo in their lives. But as we've seen today, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem in triumph, he was in full control, wasn't he, of all things. And although sinful men were instrumental in what Jesus went through on his journey to the cross, the one true king of all men was riding into Jerusalem with just one aim, and that was to do the Father's will. And the Father's will was that Jesus would willingly lay down his life for you and for me. Well, the question we're left with today as we close is this. Is Jesus the one true king that we worship? The true king who, in response to his death and his resurrection, we've willingly handed over full control of our lives to today. And we're allowing him to lead us today. We're allowing him to guide us into a closer likeness of him, to be a people who won't reject him, but be a people who will do his will today in this world. Amen. Father, we want to thank you for John's Gospel, for the account of this triumphal entry into Jesus, Jesus coming as King, 
And Father, we pray today that if we haven't already made Jesus King in our lives, that he will soon be on the throne within us, reigning supreme. Father, we pray today that as your people, we may bow down in, in worship before you, our rightful King, our rightful Saviour. Amen. Well, of course, if we go back to uh, uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians in uh, Philippians chapter 2, it says, we see that, uh, you know, uh, Jesus, uh, Paul says that we have the like, same mindset as, as Christ Jesus and that we become humble before him. And that's something we're probably going to look at on uh, Maundy Thursday. But, of course, he, Paul goes on to say that a time will come when every knee will bow before the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's our last hymn today. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess him, King of glory now. Let's sing this great hymn tonight, uh, today, shall we, as we close our service. What a wonderful promise we have at the end of that hymn. Brothers, this Lord Jesus, and sisters, of course, shall return again with his Father's glory and with his angel train. For all wreaths of empire meet upon his brow and our hearts confess him King of glory now. Well, we can do that, can't we, each and every day as we confess him the King of our lives, the King of glory. Well, before we have our final prayer today, just a little reminder that uh, our Easter Sunday celebration service will be at 10.30am in the church. And if you haven't already let us know that you want to come, then please do give us a call. The number will be on the screen later. So I have to say that spaces will be limited. So if you want to get in fairly quickly, that would be great. Well, our closing prayer today comes from Jude, and it's Jude 24, 25. And this is what he says. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and and for evermore. Amen. Well, I pray you have a good day, and I pray you have a good week, and I pray that you can join us for our Maundy Thursday service, uh, and for our Good Friday service, and then 
by God's grace, we'll see each other next Sunday. God bless.